The first exercise of the fracture of the posterior wall is performed through the coker langenbeck approach. For the coker langenbeck approach and this fracture, the patient is placed in a lateral position on a standard table. The surgeon stands behind the patient. The head is to the left, the foot is to the right. The gluteus maximus muscle is reflected posteriorly. A Holman retractor is placed into the lesser sciatic notch, retracting the obturator internus muscle and the sciatic nerve posteriorly. The sciatic nerve must be palpated to make sure that the tension is not too great. A second retractor can be placed into the greater sciatic notch, retracting the piriformis muscle. A Holman retractor can be placed with a tip driven into the inferior iliac wing. Care should be taken not to stretch the superior gluteal nerve. The entire retroacetabular surface is now exposed from the superior portion of the ischial tuberosity to the inferior ilium. The quadrilateral surface and pelvic brim can be accessed by palpation through the greater sciatic notch. The interior of the joint can be visualized by performing a capsulotomy along the rim of the acetabulum. For this exercise, we'll use part of the 3.5 instrument set. To hold the fragments in place, we use a periosteal elevator, an osteotome, and a bone holding rod with pointed ball tip. The template serves as a model for bending the plate with the bending pliers for reconstruction plates and the bending iron. The bone is placed in a vise as if the patient were in the lateral position and the surgeon standing behind the patient. After performing a coker langenbeck approach, the surgeon has a view of the posterior column of the acetabulum and the retroacetabular surface, which is seen to have a defect where the fracture of the posterior wall is. Two fragments of the posterior wall, which include a portion of the retroacetabular surface, are seen attached to the hip capsule. We can see the fractured cancellous bone surface where these fragments came from. An impacted segment of the cartilage of the posterior wall is visible in the fracture site. The femoral head is distracted from the acetabulum to visualize into the joint. The joint is cleaned and intra-articular free fragments are removed. An intra-articular free fragment is seen to be covered partially by articular cartilage and to be made up entirely by cancellous bone. This fragment should not be discarded and should be included in the final reconstruction of the joint. The femoral head was reduced into a congress position with the acetabulum and used as a mold for reconstruction of the posterior wall. An osteotome is used to elevate the impacted segment of cartilage and cancellous bone. Bone graft can be obtained from either the pelvis or proximal femur and is usually necessary to buttress a defect following elevation of the impacted segment. The free fragment, including cartilage and cancellous bone, should be carefully examined for any keys to its proper position and orientation. Its correct position will also be determined to a degree by trial and error. These two fragments of bone that have been repositioned will not be directly internally fixed. They will, however, be held in place by the overlying segments of the posterior wall and the implant applied to the overlying segments.
The fragments of the posterior wall, which comprise a part of the retroacetabular surface, are now reduced into place. It's usually necessary to reduce both fragments simultaneously with one's finger and also with the help of the ball spike. A periosteal elevator can also be used. A lag screw is placed into each fragment near the rim of the acetabulum. The screws must leave adequate room for the plate, which will span the fragments. With the patient in a lateral position, the 2.5 millimeter drill bit is directed vertically in order to avoid entering the joint. After drilling both holes, it's often advisable and quite instructive to redisplace the fragments of the posterior wall after drilling the hole in order to make sure that the screws will be outside the joint. The depth of the holes is measured. Now that we're satisfied with the hole positions, the fragments are overdrilled with the 3.5 millimeter drill bit for placement of the 3.5 millimeter lag screws. Insertion of the corresponding length screws. It's sometimes best not to fully tighten the 3.5 millimeter screws at this point if obliquity of the screw direction to the fracture plane causes a displacement. Fixation is completed by application of an 8-hole straight 3.5 reconstruction plate which spans the posterior wall fracture from the inferior ilium to the ischial tuberosity. A straight plate is used because it's more flexible than the curved plate. However, it's contoured into a curve that parallels the posterior rim of the acetabulum. A curved 3.5 reconstruction bending template is often helpful in contouring the plate. In this case, one screw hole will be completely above, as well as below, the posterior wall fracture segments. The distal end of the plate will be sharply upturned on the superior pole of the ischial tuberosity. The first step in plate bending is to bend a plate on edge and establish its curve. This curve should roughly parallel the rim of the acetabulum. The concave and convex contours of the plate are then bent in the normal manner using the reconstruction plate bender. Multiple small bends in the plate establish a smooth rounded contour. At the moment, the plate is slightly under contoured so that with the lower end of the plate fixed to the bone, the upper end of the plate is off the bone by two or three millimeters. The final bending of the plate will actually be done by the screws, which bend the plate across the posterior wall and ensure that the plate places pressure against the posterior wall fragments. Place the screw into the hole that lies in the concavity of the plate, just above the ischial tuberosity. This is a 3.5 millimeter screw and a 2.5 millimeter drill bit. Measure the depth with the depth gauge and insert the screw. The screw is incompletely tightened to allow positioning of the plate. 
2.5 millimeter drill hole is drilled through the upper screw hole at the upper extremity of the hole in order to create a compression effect. Measure the depth and insert the screw. Tighten the screws at the two ends of the plate alternately to complete the bending of the plate and tension it over the posterior wall fragments. Always take care to direct the screws away from the joint. Another screw at the upper end of the plate is inserted. A final screw is directed distally into the ischium. The lag screws in the posterior wall may now be fully tightened if they have not been previously. The final reduction is typically not visualized because the hip capsule is left attached to the posterior fragments to preserve vascularity and hip stability. In our fracture model, however, we will now open the hip capsule to visualize the final reduction.